Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Efkan Nifti, the CEO of the Caspi Impalasa Center. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here once again after June. Uh, we had a very good conversation uh, a few months ago in London. It's once again good to be here in London and for a more uh, focused conversation on the energy security in the Caspian region. Uh, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Honored Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, the Caspian Policy Center is proud to host the Caspian Energy Security Conference to bring together expert opinions from the Caspian region, UK and the US to discuss energy security, connectivity and energy transition in the Caspian region, as well as the United Kingdom's involvement and opportunities in these areas. As a think tank based in, in the United States, we are very excited to host our second event, as I said, uh, here in London. We hope that this will become an ongoing platform for debate and discussion regarding the region, as we are proud to provide this policy and business uh, platform. The Caspian region holds strategic significance due to key several factors. Um, the region's importance has grown in last uh, few years and in, in since the becoming independent in the, uh, in the region, countries started working uh, together with each other to develop uh, important sectors of economy and also uh, improve uh, inter-regional trade. The region is at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, serving as a critical transit hub for energy, trade and transportation networks. The Caspian provides access to important markets and serves as a gateway to the world, to the Caucasus, Central Asia, and beyond. As I mentioned in my uh, speech in the beginning, the partnership in the region, in the Caspian region, has grown to include cooperation across multiple sectors of engagement. We have seen increased number of meetings in the region uh, on the heads of state levels, ministers, and increased engagement from the U.S. lately, as well as we have seen C5 plus one meeting in New York this year on the uh, first ever uh, summit by Biden with the presence of the Central Asian countries. And I think now connecting Central Asia to the Caucasus is an imperative and a goal that we need to achieve altogether. In the areas of energy security, we have seen countries in the region diversifying their hydrocarbon export routes through the Trans-Caspian route. Last year, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan reached an agreement envisioning the annual transit of 1.5 million tons of Kazakh oil through the baku tbilisi jehan pipeline. This amount is expected to grow as further optimization of the Trans-Caspian corridor can facilitate both Europe's and Caspian region's goals for diversification of energy supply routes. We also see that a lot of big oil and energy uh, majors are leading uh, close engagement with the region through extracting hydrocarbon resources as well as exploring its vast renewable energy potential. Conditions for the transportation of Turkmen gas to the Europe seem to have become more feasible uh, with the shortages that are threatening Europe due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In August, we have seen Turkmenistan sign its first, evil, first ever deal to supply natural gas to U EU with the Trans-Caspian Corridor. As Europe seeks alternative oil and gas resources in light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Trans-Caspian pipeline is gaining renewed attention and underscoring the growing significance of region in facilitating transporting energy to uh, Europe. Actually, the Caspian's history is well known with oil and gas, but at this stage, we also see huge improvements in the renewable energy sector and investments in the Caspian region. And in this regard, there is a huge potential and it's ranked second to the world for its wind energy potential. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are making strides in initiating their transition to low carbon energy, developing national hydro hydrogen strategies and implementing renewable energy initiatives. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan may have the opportunity to leverage their surplus electricity from hydropower plants. Central Asian states are also aiming to develop new wind, solar, and hydropower infrastructure projects, adopt more climate-friendly regulations in order to pursue their zero, net zero uh, goals. In this line, exchange of views and expertise between the West and the Caspian region is crucial. The Black Sea Energy Submarine Cable signed by the European Commission, Azerbaijan, Romania, Hungary, and Georgia, aims to establish secure energy sources for Europe. The main priority of the project is to deliver renewable energy to Romania through underwater electrical cable passing through Azerbaijan and Georgia. And 
last week we have also seen Central Asian countries, uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, engaging regarding this project in Baku. The Caspian region continues to play a significant role in meeting the world's immediate needs for energy, transition, and diversification of supply. As I mentioned in my uh, some of the projects that I uh, highlighted in my uh, remarks, outside the governments and companies should be looking beyond immediate needs and act on the region's potential to help meet future global energy demands. As pressing as today's energy needs are, future needs will be much greater. So in light of our Caspian Energy Security Conference here in London, I want to express our gratitude to the honored guests, excellencies, our embassy partners, especially, and partners uh, for joining here us today. I also want to thank FCDO colleagues to be here in this room. I look forward to listening to our distinguished guests and keynote speakers, and thank you for your enthusiasm and ability to participate in today's discussions. Great turnout, and hopefully we'll have a great uh, uh, panels, uh, and you'll find it useful. So I want to ha ask now uh, our UK advisor, Ambassador David Moran, to introduce our keynote speaker and our first panel. Thank you so much. Well, thanks uh, very much. Uh, the first half of my, uh, my task is uh, very short, uh, but very pleasant. Uh, I have, uh, have the pleasure to uh, invite uh, Tim Stern of the Foreign Office, uh, Director of International Energy Diplomacy, to come up here and make the keynote speak for us. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, as David said, I'm Tim Stern. I'm the Director for International Energy Diplomacy at the UK's Foreign Office. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Efghan. Thank you, David. Thank you, Caspian Policy Center, for inviting me. And thank you to all the uh, ambassadors and industry representatives who are here. I look forward to a really good discussion. It's also a timely discussion. We're heading into our second winter since Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the cuts to European gas supplies. We're less than two weeks from COP28, where energy and the role of energy and the industry and decarbonisation and net zero will be high on the agenda. And we're in the midst of a regional crisis in the Middle East, which despite its tragedy, has not yet spread into energy markets, but we still see some major risks on the horizon. Energy security remains central to our approach in the UK, both to national security and international security. And last year's events mean that few of us will forget in a hurry the connectedness between national security and our defence objectives and our energy security objectives. But we've also seen the world looking anew at energy security and redefining it. So it doesn't just mean securing the supplies of oil and gas that we need for the present, but also building the clean energy supply chains that we need for the future. Mm -hmm. And we see governments and industry and civil society and consumers responding and repositioning themselves in line with net zero and looking at how they can take advantage economically, commercially, strategically from a green energy transition, which is happening fast. And we know that succeeding requires a lot more international cooperation and partnership, but against a global backdrop where we're seeing increasing risks of protectionism and trade barriers. So it's a difficult time. And we think that regional connectivity and cooperation is clearly absolutely essential for both energy security and for the transition to net zero. Neither work if we try and work in isolation. So in the UK, now after Brexit, we've reset our relationships with Europe and we're strengthening our cooperation with lots of European countries. We're busy building new subsea electricity interconnectors, uh, with countries like Germany, which will be the largest we have. We've rejoined the North Sea's energy cooperation, and we work closely with all the countries who share offshore, offshore energy resources with the UK because we can't do it on our own. We're building new wind farms in the North Sea, where we've already got the first and the second and the third largest wind farms in the world, and we're building multi-purpose uh, interconnectors so that those wind farms connect not just to one country but to many countries and can supply whoever needs energy at the time. It's new and it's complex. We're all learning it together. We don't have all the answers in the UK for sure. We definitely don't have all the answers in government. Uh, we don't think any country does yet. And so I'm really keen to learn from the expertise in this room um, as we talk today. But we do know that getting it right for us, but I think for everyone requires regular dialogue between governments, regulators, industry. Governments can't do any of it on their own, but they can help to set transparent and consistent regulation so that both sides have certainty and can provide certainty to industry. 
And despite some headwinds in the UK's renewable market, we're now making some really good progress. We doubled the strike price for offshore wind in our new auction rounds under the Contract for Difference scheme, which is our flagship way of um, getting private sector to bid for renewable contracts. We're expecting some further announcements in the autumn statement um, coming very soon about our support for green manufacturing and to speed up grid connections and infrastructure planning, which we consistently hear from industry are some of the major barriers to going faster with the transition to renewables. And we've also committed to host an energy security conference next spring, uh, where we hope to work with partners in the Caspian region and around the world to increase cooperation on both energy security and our progress to net zero. We'll tell you more about that as we develop plans. And we see the Caspian region as absolutely central to all of this. From the UK's perspective, there's increasing economic and strategic opportunities for partnership, both ensuring stable oil and gas supplies now, but also decarbonizing the sector, learning from companies in the region, investing in wind and solar at massive scale, generating hydrogen, and tapping into the supplies of critical minerals that we need for clean technology. We see enormous potential. And our minister, Leo Doherty, has been busy visiting every country in the region to try and strengthen our relationships. We're really supportive of Caspian regional connectivity and development of the middle corridor to diversify supplies to the European market, to increase commercial access to the Caspian and to support new infrastructure. And there are some good examples of what the UK is doing. So, for example, UK Export Finance is providing guarantee to Turkey's largest solar farm. We're supporting the development of an offshore wind roadmap in Azerbaijan to unlock seven gigawatts of potential through the World Bank ESMAP program. And the UK is the largest contributor to the $200 million climate investment fund support for Central Asia's green energy sectors. But there is, of course, much, much more that we can do together. I wanted to talk more about two things, um, and I won't go on for very long, but one is um, what we're seeing in terms of developments around carbon border adjustment mechanisms. This is something that we all see um, on the horizon. The EU has already committed to its approach to carbon border adjustment mechanisms and see it as essential for their progress towards net zero and to protect and support their own industries. And I think other countries are likely to follow. It's going to redefine the trade landscape in many ways. It's going to redefine many of the partnerships. For some people, for some countries, it will be very difficult but it's coming. And so we need to work together. We need to help our industries um, to prepare for that. And I see that as something which is going to quickly redefine the landscape for, for many of us. And also I mentioned uh, we're close to COP28 in two weeks time. And it's a COP that is unlike previous COPs, definitely unlike the COP that we hosted in Glasgow two years ago, in that it is really looking at how we can bring oil and gas companies, energy companies to the table as part of the solution, working with the energy industry to find solutions to get to net zero. And that's a new approach. It's going to be challenging in a COP environment where there are lots of people with different agendas and different perspectives on the right solution. But we see it as essential because if you can't have that conversation and that dialogue, then you're not going to find any solutions at all. One of the major focuses for COP, there will be many, but one of them is around how you decarbonize industry and how you decarbonize production, so methane reduction and ending gas flaring. And we, and I know many people here as well, have invested a lot of time and support in how we can do that. We think it's something where you can really make a difference, where you can recognize that you still need ongoing production, but you can clean that production up. We've got the technology, we've got the industry incentives to fix it. Flaring gas is economically wasteful, it's a waste of resources, there's no benefit from it. So we really look to this COP and beyond to make progress on reducing methane emissions and ending uh, gas flaring as much as possible. We'd really encourage you to look at that as well and to work with us and to work with the UAE's COP on that agenda. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for setting up the panel, David, and I look forward to the discussion and to learning and listening um, from a lot of the experts in the room. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim, uh, for that. I, I was interested to hear your mentioning uh, of the... Uh, uh, the Global Energy Security Conference next uh, next year, which um, the announcements of which uh, was the uh, sort of origin of our decision to hold this event today. The, this is meant to be part of the pathway uh, through to uh, through to next spring, uh, putting the the Caspian region into the context of that larger global picture. So thank you very much.
Uh, I'd like now to invite uh, the ambassadors and representatives uh, to, uh, to who are speaking today to come up here and, and join us, uh, join me, since I'm the only one here, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, have a seat and then I'll, I'll start, I'll start uh, by saying that I'm hugely grateful to all of you for agreeing to, uh, to uh, come here and speak today. Uh, and um, these opening remarks will set the context for the two panels uh, to come. Uh, you will have a choice of uh, a binary choice of uh, staying in your seat if you wish. You have to turn on uh, the, the microphone. Uh, or you can come up to the podium. Uh, it's it's entirely up to you. And I, I will call you uh, <clears throat> coming uh, right to left uh, along the type of the table as we sit, left to right to the rest of you. Um, it's going to be a challenge to, to uh, uh, get through everything um, in good time. So I don't think there'll be time, I'm afraid, for Q&A on this panel. However, I hope that during the break, uh, there will be opportunities to to talk uh, and and uh, network. So, um, without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, first ambassador uh, Sofia Katsarava, ambassador of Georgia, please. Thank you very much. Well, good morning again, uh, dear guests, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, uh, colleagues. Um, thanks to organizers, of course, Caspian Policy Center for hosting the Energy Security Conference in London at this very important time for our region and the world. And of course, thanks to Ambassador David Moran. I can never miss the opportunity to say how privileged I am to have worked with Mr. Moran while serving uh, as British Ambassador to Georgia. The timing of today's conference, as it has been noted, could not have been better. As mentioned already, uh, London will be hosting the Energy Security Conference next year, and we hope Georgia will be duly represented at the high-level conference. On that note, I'm delighted to also highlight the increasingly active and substantial partnership between uh, Georgia and the United Kingdom, the relationship which goes from strength to strength. A number of high-level visits, particularly this year, shows the commitment from both countries to continue our par partnership in the profound and its significant times of global challenges. As we speak, um, the Minister of Europe is visiting Georgia, uh, and the region, uh, and we in London are hosting a delegation from the Parliament, and the Vice Speaker of the Parliament and the Chair of the Defence and Security Committee, who are both here uh, and joined this morning. I hope today's conference will set ground well for further discussions on the importance of our region in a wide range of sectors such as energy, transportation, infrastructure, trade, technologies and investment opportunities. Today's agenda covers most pertinent and at the same time diverse and giant themes considering ongoing conflicts, Russian invasion of Ukraine, also causing disruptions of the supply chains and transit routes. With that in mind, I want to focus on three major points on where Georgia stands and how it contributes to wider security and stability, including in developing its infrastructure and energy sector, and as Georgia offers significant distribution channels and opportunities to enter global markets through newly expanded transportation infrastructure. First, Georgia has been strategically positioned at a significant geopolitical crossroads, naturally acting as a connecting bridge between Europe and Asia. Georgia is a responsible and reliable member of the international community and an integral part of the Middle Corridor, invests heavily in transport infrastructure development to ensure sufficient capacities for the years ahead. This implies land, air, and sea routes, and there are major infrastructural projects either underway or in the pipeline. The Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, the so-called Middle Corridor, has notably emerged as a secure and dependable route for freight transportation between Europe and Asia, 
The middle corridor comprises two primary routes, the bakut pilisi cars railway line connecting by land Azerbaijan with Turkey via Georgia and Georgia's Black Sea ports, establishing a maritime connection to Europe. The corridor stands out as one of the most efficient ways to connect the East with the West, offering a considerable time advantage and provides access to vital European markets. The government of Georgia implements major infrastructural projects in partnership with its strategic partners, such as Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Kazakhstan. One other major project also in the pipeline is the development of the Anaklia Deep Seaport, which is another top priority for the government. The project aims to develop, construct, operate, and transfer a state of the art deep seaport uh, on, east coast, on the east coastline of the Black Sea. The second uh, uh, point, which I want to focus on, obviously, is Georgia is an, uh, energy security and Georgia's role. Georgia is rich in renewable energy resources with hydro resources standing out as particularly noteworthy. The target is to utilize renewable energy sources, especially by implementing large hydropower plants. A new renewable energy support scheme based on competition and market principles was developed and approved last year to facilitate and attract investors in energy sector. Also, uh, which has been noted earlier, one of the pivotal projects contributing to Georgia's green energy production and export is the Black Sea Submarine Cable Initiative, which is promising for Georgia's future energy landscape as it aligns with the country's commitments to developing renewable resources and making steps towards a more sustainable energy future. Our neighboring countries, Azerbaijan, Romania, and Hungary are part of this ambitious project. And the third point and the vital point is to obviously raise the pro profile and awareness of Georgia and the region being crucial as an energy transit route in order to implement the current and planned critically important projects. We need to attract more investments to the country and the region. And I appreciate this very conference serves as one of the platforms to raise the profile and address these issues. On a similar note, Georgia very recently hosted Silk Road Forum, which addressed related topics such as improving connectivity, infrastructure, technologies, etc., which was attended by a number of uh, international high-level participants. I believe these and similar platforms will also contribute to putting Georgia on the map and the region, obviously, as a country and the region which support energy security future, energy secure future. For this to happen, Georgia, despite ongoing challenges, Russia's ongoing occupation of uh, Georgian territories will continue to be a secure, stable and reliable partner for the region and the international community in the scope of wider energy security context. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite uh, Ulan Jusupov, uh, Ambassador of the Kyrgyz Republic, to speak next. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador. <clears throat> Dear ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> first of all, I am also joining uh, my colleague to express my gratitude to the Caspian Policy Center for organizing this important event. We should have discussed the strategic energy, energy cooperation UK and the Caspian. The ongoing global processes have a direct impact on stability and security in our region and bigger Caspian region, and, other, and on the other hand, strengthen its role and significance. Strengthening relations with the countries of the region is a natural top priority of our country. We know that with satisfaction and that in recent years, regional cooperation in Central Asia has been developing consistently and in all directions. We see our region as a single geoeconomic uh, space in which all forms of economic cooperation and interaction are successfully formed. We see our region as a geopolitical intermediary uh, through which interaction and cooperation between members of the international community takes place. We see our, our region as a highly connected and dynamic communities that share and support similar cultural, historical, and traditional values and beliefs. The driver of economic growth in Central Asia is the development of regional transit, energy, transport, and logistics potential. 
It is priority active development that will stimulate integration into the world economy and ensure connectivity within the region. Central Asia has a rich renewable energy potential, significant opportunities to improve energy efficiency and case for increased regional energy cooperation. Today we have USAID Central Asia Energy Project, which is helping five Central Asian countries to achieve their national and regional energy security priorities and reap the economic benefits of regional uh, energy trade. The project works closely with national governments and key energy stakeholders to so address three main objectives, national market liberalization reform, clean energy, and regional electricity market. What is important is increasing energy security, regional connectivity, and the introduction of clean technologies in Central Asia. On national level, the Kyrgyz Republic has sufficient reserves of fuel and energy resources. The fuel energy complex consists of two large industries, fuel production, coal, oil, and gas, and electricity generation. Today, I will briefly mention about our hydropower potential. Hydropower potential in Kyrgyzstan has a great potential and a high energy saturation. Thanks to the mountains, landscapes, reservoirs, and rivers, hydroelectric power stations <coughs> are the key technology for the long-term development of the Republic's energy sector. Energy security and sustainable development are characteristic not only of hydropower within the country, but also the energy systems of neighboring countries, which are interdependent. To date, seven dams has been built in Kyrgyzstan, seven large hydroelectric power stations, 16 small hydroelectric power stations are operating, and power transmission lines are stretched over 65,000 kilometers. Our country has almost half of the region's water resources. The hydropower potential of Kyrgyzstan is about 143 billion kilowatt per year, but, but uh, more than 13 is current, 13 percent is currently used. But today the government's projects provide for the construction of new 18 hydroelectric power stations and 63 small hydropower stations. As we discussed the path forward for a sustainable and energy secure future, it is cr uh, crucial to emphasize the collaborative efforts between uh, our countries, Kyrgyzstan, and the broader Caspian region. The challenges posed by energy market volatility, supply chain disruptions, and geopol geopolitical complexities demand innovative solutions and strategic partnerships. Let us explore key aspects of how we can map a sustainable path, identity investment opportunities, and foster international cooperation for the mutually beneficial energy secure, secure future your sustainable path forward. Diversification and re renewable energy. Both the UK and Kyrgyzstan, along with the big Caspian region, should prior prioritize diversification of energy sources. The transition of to renewable energy, such as wind, solar, and hydroelectric power, can play a pivotal role in creating a sustainable and, and environmentally friendly energy landscape. Kyrgyzstan also has a great potential for various types of renewable energy sources. We encourage investors, international partners, and financial institutions to invest in cooperation to implement projects for the construction of hydroelectric power stations and other renewable energy facilities. Energy efficiency, efficiency measures. Implementing energy efficiency measures in infrastructure and in, in industries is essential. This includes adopting advanced technologies, improving energy management systems, and encouraging sustainable practices to minimize waste and optimize resource use. Collaborative research and development. Investing in joint research and development initiatives can lead to breakthroughs in energy technologies. By sharing knowledge and expertise, the UK and the Caspian region can accelerate progress towards sustainable energy solutions. Areas of investment opportunities, infrastructure development. Our region offers significant opportunities for infrastructure development in the energy sector. 
investments in modernizing and expanding energy infrastructure, including pipelines, grids, and storage facilities can enhance connectivity and reliability. Renewable energy projects. Collaborative ventures in renewable energy projects such as solar and wind farms can tap into the, into the natural resources abundant in the Caspian region. The UK's experience in financing and implementing such projects can be contribute to their success. Technology transfer. Facilitating the transfer of energy-related technologies from the UK to Kyrgyzstan and the broader the Caspian region can enhance local capabilities. This is, includes knowledge transfer in areas like renewables energy, smart grids, and energy storage solutions. International cooperation. Diplomatic engagement. Strengthening diplomatic ties between the UK Kyrgyzstan and the Caspian countries is crucial for creating an environment conducive to international collaboration. <laughs> Regular dialogues, diplomatic missions, and joint working groups can foster mutual understanding. Policy harmonization. Aligning policy related to energy, trade, and investment can remove barriers and create predictable regulatory environment. International partners can collaborate to advocate for the policies that encourage sustainable energy practices. Risk mitigation. Joint efforts in mitigating geopolitical and economic risk are essential. Developing risk sharing mechanisms, promoting political stability and addressing security concerns can enhance confidence for international investors. In conclusion, the path to a more energy secure future requires a collective and coordinated effort. Our par partner countries, Kyrgyzstan and the Caspian region, can capitalize on their respective strengths, foster innovation, and build a resilient energy ecosystem that benefits all. By working together, we can create a legacy of sustainable development, economic growth, and the in environmental uh, stu uh, stewardship. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'd now like to uh, I'd now like to invite Osman Karay Atash, uh, Ambassador of Turkey. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear friends, and we also have a, a member of the Georgian Parliament here, uh, honourable member of the Parliament. Uh, I also would like to start by uh, thanking the Caspian uh, Security Forum. Uh, David and F. Kambe, for bringing this vital issue uh, to London. And this is our second meeting, and I'm so happy that uh, I'm part of the second meeting as well, because we believe by living in this region, the importance of the region in terms of energy security and connectivity. And we also want this to be seen uh, from London as well. And we are happy that it's increasingly becoming visible when you look uh, from London as we see it. Obviously, there are two major issues uh, which are the uh, talk of the world and uh, not the town. Uh, one is uh, twin transformation and the other one is uh, energy security. Energy security is important for all of us, not only for our countries, but as individuals, companies, households. Um, but the green transformation is, I think, uh, the more difficult issue because on paper, we are all committed for this, but as the uh, deadlines approach, we start to realize how challenging this will be uh, on the uh, way ahead. Uh, as you see uh, from the recent uh, literature, we start even to discuss whether uh, solar, uh, wind, or even uh, battery power uh, will make us more dependent uh, on uh, certain countries given the limited availability of uh, rare uh, earth elements and uh, uh, their concentration in certain countries. The other day, even I saw uh, on paper that after the election of the new uh, libertarian president of Argentina, uh, there was uh, a discussion whether this will affect uh, the world's access to lithium, uh, lithium resources uh, in, in this country. 
Uh, in any case, uh, while we pursue uh, green transformation, we need uh, uninterrupted, affordable and sustainable energy supply for uh, our economies. This is just one reason that makes the Caspian region strategic. The Caspian Basin has been a contributor to global energy security for many decades now. And with our historical ties and economic ties to the region, Turkey stands as an integral part of it, advocating for increased cooperation and connectivity to further tap the region's potential. Projects like the uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline, Baku Tbilisi Erzurum gas pipeline, and the recent Tanap Trans Anatolian natural gas pipeline have significantly contributed to global energy security. It has been now 16 years that the BTC is carrying regions oil resources, including uh, the resources from Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan to global markets. Uh, and TANAP, which is the backbone of the Southern Gas Corridor, Azerbaijan and natural gas is flowing to Italy. And we also aim to bring now the Turkmen gas, a project that we have been working for more than a decade now. Uh, and it will be a huge achievement if we can also manage to do this. The value of such uh, energy infrastructure is better understood in today's volatile regional setting, both uh, in the uh, Middle East and uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Turkey is also evolving, uh, increasingly evolving into be becoming an energy trading hub, connecting resource-rich countries from the Caspian Middle East and Central Asia to uh, the European and global uh, markets. Indeed, we have made uh, substantial investments uh, to our energy infrastructure. The expansion of gas storage capacities, the diversified sourcing, the development of LNG infrastructure, the liberalization of the gas market, and the discovery of natural gas in the Black Sea are collectively bringing us closer to this objective. Recent agreements that we have signed with uh, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and Hungary are examples of our engagement in enhancing energy security of our southeastern European neighbors. There is much to be done, obviously, and we are working with uh, Azerbaijan on how to increase our contribution to support the European energy security. It is actually not only the energy that makes Caspian vital, but it's also transport connectivity. The middle corridor has already demonstrated its reliability in the aftermath of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. And recent developments in the Middle East have reconfirmed its relevance and uh, it questions the doability of uh, other alternatives. Here, let me also briefly mention the uh, new integration process that we have been leading, the organization of uh, Turkic states, uh, which is also a strategic initiative. And this integration model has a geoeconomic dimension to facilitate energy trade and transportation uh, ties. We try hard to make uh, the middle corridor an attractive and sustainable alternative with multilateral agreements and joint investments. Obviously, in this uh, larger picture, uh, public-private partnerships are key to develop uh, the infrastructure and to integrate the region's energy infrastructure and transport links to the international world. The UK, uh, with its intensified uh, refocus uh, on the region, and we are happy about this, holds potential as a key contributor, as Mr. Director mentioned, UKF has already uh, started to finance uh, some key green projects, uh, not only in Turkey, but in the uh, larger region. And the um, the trade representative of the UK in Istanbul is also dealing with the region, and they are doing a great job, actually, especially the Consul General and uh, his friends. Um, UK is in a special position also given its robust financial markets. So uh, institutions like UKF or EBRD uh, should focus more on, on financing such projects, which will increase the connectivity and uh, as well as green transformation and energy 
security. As uh, Turkey and I'm sure uh, as other uh, regional countries, our neighbors, we look forward to exploring uh, cooperation opportunities in the region with the UK together with our Caspian partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, for the next speaker, I want to first of all say welcome Ram Shan for, uh, to London. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Rafshan Usmanov, uh, Ambassador to, uh, from uh, Uzbekistan, to speak now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good morning, uh, yeah. ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Your Excellencies. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, David Moran for inviting me here. And I was very much surprised to see the old friend we met 18 years ago back in Tashkent. Uh, now we are here in London, and I'm very glad to see you well in your position. And I hope we'll be working quite uh, productive together. And of course, I would like to express my gratitude to the Caspian Policy Center for inviting me here. Less than a week into my new job as an ambassador, I am delighted that uh, this, my very first speaking engagement, uh, is about an issue that is truly uh, matters. And I know it matters to all of us. But allow me to first outline why it matters so much to Uzbekistan. First and foremost, we know from bitter experience that we can, what can happen when economic development is pursued without due regard to its environmental effects. We and our neighbors in Kazakhstan uh, inherited what uh, has been described by the UN as one of the world's most environmental disasters. This, of course, is the Aral Sea, which is one which is one time was the first la largest lake in the world. But intensive agriculture and uh, attendant irrigation during the Soviet era drained the sea, turning much of it into desert, destroying a once thriving uh, fishing industry and uh, leading to horrific pollution problems. And David been there, I believe, during his time in Tashkent. He saw this by his own uh, eyes. But this conference is about energy sec security. And here again, we in Uzbekistan have learned unfortunate lessons which are obliged to share with the world. We were once energy rich, now we are not, uh, or at least not rich in conventional uh, sources of energy. Until quite recently, my nation was a significant exporter of natural gas with experts speaking at about 17.6 billion cubic meters in 28, in 2008. Uh, over the last five years, our exports have steadily declined. And in the past year, we have even begun exporting some natural gas from our neighbors. Simultaneously, electricity supply has become unstable leading to occasional short-term power outrages in some parts of our country. You will wonder why these problems uh, had arisen. And here we come to some good news, actually. Uh, the main problem, if we can call it so, uh, is fast economic growth. Uh, with the biggest population in Central Asia, rising industrialization and expanding consumer demand are putting more and more pressure on energy provision. Uh, these are the growing pains uh, of a young but the fast growing nation it's obvious uh, and uh, as a consequence is a consequence uh, uzbekistan is in the midst of truly major reforms of its energy sector we are now on track to a more secure and greener uh, energy future we have realized for instance that while we may no longer be as rich as we were in high uh, hydro carbon based energy we are very rich indeed in another natural energy source, namely sunshine. We enjoy on average some 4,500 hours of sunshine every year. Needless to say, the winds crossing our vast plains have also been a long ignored reserves before. Starting in 2020, our government uh, opened the electricity sector for private investment. 
via public partnership, private, uh, via public private partnerships. The first results of this decision were the commissioning of two solar photovoltaic uh, power plants with a capacity of 100 megawatts each in 2021 and in 2022, in cooperation with uh, Mazdar and Total Eran. The same formula was applied to wind uh, generation. At, at present, the share of renewable energy in total power generation in Uzbekistan is about 10%, namely, mainly due to the country's hydro hydroelectric -elect power plants. The government initially set a goal to increase the share to 25% by 2030. However, in February of this year, my government made a decision to accelerate the construction of renewable energy facilities and bring the share of solar and wind power to 25% of total production by 2026. It's now expected that by 20. 30, 44 solar and wind projects with a total capacity of 21.7 gigawatts will be implemented. A further consequences of Uzbekistan's own energy difficulties has been an increased awareness of the need for collaboration with our closest neighbors. I'm sure my colleagues from uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan can confirm that their governments are also taking a region-wide view to energy security. In September, at the consultative meeting of the Central Asian Heads of State in Dushanbe, our president put forward a series of proposals for greater regional cooperation. The summit stressed the importance of further expansion of cooperation between relevant ministries and national companies in the field of geological exploration and development of promising fields, and the expansion of existing and creation of new infrastructure for shortage and supply of energy carriers. In addition, the construction of new electricity transmission facilities and the significant potential of the development of hydropower are set to become important areas of cooperation for all of us. A new regional strategy on adaptation of climate change was initiated and the ministers of the environment were tasked to, uh, with creating a unified climate agenda for the region and a topic set for further discussion new spring uh, and the and the new uh, and the topic was set for further discussion next spring at our inaugural Samarkand International Forum on climate change so in other words uh, we in Uzbekistan and across Central Asia are taking energy security and the challenges of climate change very seriously indeed and we know we are vulnerable. Uh, we know we need to take action and we will listen to what is said today here by all the experts and because on what you say and what kind of decisions will be made this is depends our future and this is really important for us as i said and i believe uh today's event will come up with the good solutions and the good approaches for the uh, for every country individually to the Central Asia and for the whole Caspian region as well. So once again, thank you very much for hosting me here and I wish all the best to all participants. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I'm now going to uh, pass uh, the floor to uh, Gunnel. Salamova, uh, councillor for um, the Embassy of Azerbaijan. Thank you very much, Mr. Mora. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend um, my gratitude to the Caspian Policy Center for hosting this conference. We believe it's a timely opportunity to touch base and reflect on the achievements and future prospects on the Caspian region's aspirations for connectivity, energy, and economic development, which, by the way, are quite broad, but uh, related nor uh, not notions. Infrastructure is an important element, making these notions real and practical. Azerbaijan, by actively investing in and modernizing the relevant infrastructure, has contributed a lot to global connectivity and has become an important hub of east-west and north-south international transport corridors. 
Azerbaijan is making valuable contribution to the sustainable operation of Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, a so-called middle corridor, which holds significant potential for boosting the world trade in the most efficient way. The potential of the middle corridor is closely linked to the capacity of ports and railways. In this regard, active work is being done to increase the capacity of Baku International Sea Trade Port from 15 million tons to 25 million tons per year. Azerbaijan is also an active initiator and trusted partner in implementation of a number of other regional connectivity projects, such as Baku Tbilisi Karsh Railway and Transcaucasus Fiber Optic Cable Project. We are also working with many countries on the realization of other transport routes. Azerbaijan is a reliable energy partner and has an important role in global energy security. It would not be an exaggeration to say that successful cooperation on energy constitutes the backbone between Azerbaijan and UK relationship. Our partnership has been exemplary during the last three decades with Sokar and BP, cooperating in the development of the Shahdeniz field, as well as the Baku tbilisi Jehan and Southern Gas Corridor pipelines. Today, the Southern Gas Corridor contributes to the security of supply and market competition, two unchanged pillars of the European energy policy. In the future, the volume of Azerbaijani gas transported to Europe uh, through Southern Gas Corridor will be doubled. In light of the constant energy crisis and spiking energy prices in different parts of the globe, we believe that abandoning traditional fuels and drastic cuts in investment in traditional energy sectors is not a way to reach energy transition goals. Azerbaijan supports balanced approach to energy transition, which stands high in our agenda. By 2027, the share of renewable energy is expected to reach 33% in electricity investment and from the current 7% to 25% in electricity generation. This means that by 2030, our goal, by, goal of 30% will be over fulfilled. Sorry for so many digits. Azerbaijan, Georgia, Romania, Hungary, uh, Black Sea Submarine Cable Project is another initiative to accelerate green energy transition in the participating states. Today, by the way, the fifth ministerial meeting will be held in Budapest. Azerbaijan is also planning to utilize its immense offshore wind potential in its section of the Caspian Sea. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking about connectivity and green energy aspirations of Azerbaijan would not be complete without reference to Azerbaijan's respective efforts in the liberated territories. The government of Azerbaijan has launched a large-scale rehabilitation and reconstruction works in Karabakh. Huge transport and energy infrastructure projects are being implemented. The concepts such as green energy zone, Smart city, smart village will altogether transform the liberated territories into one of the leading developed, but in the meantime, the cleanest regions of Azerbaijan. We declare to establish net zero emission zone in the liberated territories by uh, 2050. We already kicked off green growth initiatives uh, with BP in the liberated territories. New realities in our region also create conditions conducive for multilateral cooperation to reach a qualitatively new level and yield economic and commercial dividends to all the countries of the region. In Azerbaijan, we believe that our region has seen enough confrontation, destruction and suffering. We underline Azerbaijan's strong commitment to the agenda of normalization and peace with Armenia and expect that Armenia will be able to utilize this historic opportunity. We also invite all partners to support Azerbaijan's post-conflict reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts towards a more secure and prosperous region. I thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, our final speaker before uh, a short coffee break mm -hmm. is uh, Mr. Ruslan Karapulov, a councillor of Kazakhstan. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Excellencies, dear guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to join my colleagues and also thank uh, the organizers, the Caspian Policy Center for hosting us today. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here, um, to have this opportunity to discuss the uh, prospects of uh, energy and uh, energy security cooperation between the Caspian 
uh, region, countries, and the United Kingdom. Um, the impacts of recent geopolitical challenges on the global energy sector elevated the importance of ensuring uh, energy security, sustainable energy supply chains, and the development of uh, green technologies. Kazakhstan, with uh, its large um, proven hydrocarbon reserves, um, has established itself as a reliable uh, supplier of uh, energy resources to the world markets. Uh, it also um, actively uh, creating um, attractive uh, investment opportunities for uh, foreign partners. Our strategic location as a significant uh, transit hub between Asia and Europe presents an inviolable proposition for foreign investors. Uh, the plans to develop the Trans-Caspian route or middle corridor not only help its internal logistics, but uh, make it an attractive destination for international companies looking to improve their supply chain efficiencies. I would like to mention that uh, the group of seven communique issued during the G7 meeting in, in May uh, highlighted uh, their commitment to increasing trade and energy cooperation with Central Asian countries. And we welcome uh, the growing interest in Kazakhstan and uh, in our region as a whole. Um, energy and energy security runs uh, like a scarlet thread uh, through Kazakhstan's domestic and uh, foreign policy. Um, I'm happy to inform that uh, today, as we are speaking, um, Minister Nusragani is uh, uh, attending the attending Astana and uh, uh, the meeting 10th anniversary uh, meeting of uh, Kazakh British uh, Intergovernmental Commission for Trade and Economic uh, Cooperation, of which uh, energy is. Uh, uh, important area. Um, earlier this month, um, during the 10th anniversary summit of uh, the Organization of uh, Turkic uh, States, uh, Kazakh President Kasim Zuma Tokayev uh, outlined energy as one of the eight pillars uh, for our uh, chairmanship in this organization for the next year. Uh, he highlighted Kazakhstan's readiness to enhance, enhance the work of the energy sector, the country's commitment to sustainable development principles and adherence to the global climate change agenda. Um, in September, President Tokayev in his annual address um, uh, reiterated uh, our strong commitment to achieve carbon neut uh, neutrality in, uh, by 2060. Uh, and Kazakhstan will focus more heavily on energy transition. Um, as the Director General of uh, International uh, Renewable Energy Agency, uh, Francesca Lecamera said during the Gas Energy Eurasian Forum in October, uh, Kazakhstan is well positioned with vast solar and wind resources to ensure a smooth energy transition. And apart from solar and wind energy, uh, Kazakhstan is also focused on the development of gas and uh, hydroelectric power, power stations and green hydrogen production. Um, also in his uh, annual address, uh, President Tokayev uh, announced uh, that our country uh, will be holding a referendum on uh, the construction of a nuclear power plant in the country. Um, and I can say that by, uh, by the last year, uh, account uh, of uh, renewables was uh, nearly 5% of uh, the country's energy balance. And this uh, figure is expected to reach 15% by uh, 
To sum up, uh, the world is facing a decisive and challenging decade for climate and energy security. And Kazakhstan is ready to join the efforts to create a greener world and always open for mutual beneficial cooperation uh, in energy transition and security. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to the, the whole panel. Uh, we'll now have a short, uh, a short break, uh, maybe 10 minutes uh, for coffee. But before you do, uh, can we uh, thank the panel as a whole? Uh, maybe. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. This morning, I find myself, so to speak, a guest in my own home. I'm Nigel Gould Davis, a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia at the International Institute of Strategic Studies, whose building this is. Uh, we are not the organizers of, the, of this event, but we are happy to offer the space to the Caspian Policy Center. Uh, and for this session, uh, we'll be discussing uh, elements strands, picking up strands that were first explored uh, by uh, diplomats in the first session, but from a wider private sector and investor perspective. Mm. Uh, as we know, Europe is leading the world in a drive to a post-carbon transition. That's something that we'll discuss in more detail in the next session. But in the short term, Europe's hydrocarbon needs remain great. And Russia's war in Ukraine has had profound uh, uh, effects on energy relations uh, with implications for consumers, suppliers, and transit states. These concerns, these urgent concerns, have fed into a broader discourse about the potential for the middle corridor, and they also intersect with wider political and economic changes in the Caucasus and Central Asia. So what are the needs, what are the opportunities in terms of financing, in terms of resources? What are the implications for broader collaboration uh, for all actors, state, commercial, non-state? So I'm very fortunate to be joined on this panel by three excellent speakers. Uh, for reasons of time, I won't share their biographies, just to say it's very nice to see two people I used to see regularly when I lived and worked in the energy industry in Kazakhstan, John Roberts and Campbell Keir, and a pleasure also to welcome Ekaterina Miroshnik of the EBRD. Uh, John, would you like to kick us off with a few more remarks, please? Nigel, thank you very much. And the Caspian Policy Center in Afghan, thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start with a puzzle. We have had, we are now, what, 20 months on from the invasion of Ukraine, more than that. And in that time, we have seen Caspian energy contacts with the European Union growing much less than I would have expected. Why is this and what do I mean by it? First of all, we have seen existing capacities stretched to the maximum by Azerbaijan, both in terms of supply and in terms of throughput through the Southern Gas Corridor. So that at the moment, roughly 11 and a half BCM a year is going right through the Southern Gas Corridor, which is one and a half BCM more than nominal capacity. But what we're not seeing, or what we've seen rather more slowly, has been the further expansion Azerbaijan says, and the European Union, under the Memorandum of Understanding from last July, July 2022, that it will double 
capacity and double output. That's generally taken to be a doubling from the 10%, 10 BCM normal capacity. But where's that extra 10 BCM going to come from? The first thing you would look for would have been a very rapid movement on developing the Absheron field in Azerbaijan. But they've been talking about the development of Absheron and moving to full field development for more than five years. And it was only this July and August with the arrival of ADNOC as a partner, that we actually got a commitment to full field development. And that's important because the initial development of Absheron is for domestic use in Azerbaijan. We did get a bonus. The full field development is no longer going to be another 3 BCM, it's going to be more like 4 BCM. So that is 4 BCM for export. But what else is there for export? Very little. Umid Babak, operated by Sokar, been promising 2 BCM since the year dot. Still a promise rather than something that's being delivered. And we don't know when it will be but it will still only be in the level of one or two BCM. Mm -hmm. What is really required are the other two fields that Azerbaijan routinely mentions in this context, which are namely the underlying deep level layer of gas under the ACG oil field and a further development of Shakhtanese. Two exploration wells have been drilled, one in each of these prospects. Both prospects are known already to contain gas, but under what conditions and under what exploitable conditions is why you have the exploration wells. And the, with the very best will in the world, I would not expect to see any significant production from either of these giant fields until the very late 2020s and probably more like 2030. It's not that Azerbaijan is not a reliable partner. It always has been. It's that it cannot actually physically deliver development of such a complex set of fields in the time available. So that means I don't see much more than five or six BCM by 2027, when the Southern Gas Corridor is supposed to be doubled. That should mean the great opportunity for Turkmenistan to supply gas should is not the same as will. We run up against the obvious problem. Do the Turkmen's really want to upset Russia for a relatively small amount, even though they could actually start inputting into a connection across the Caspian within months. Because there is actually spare capacity already between Azerbaijan and Turkey. But it's a small volume, four or five BCM at this stage. And do you really want to upset Big Brother for that? So if we're going to get Turkmenistan on board, it's the very, very classic example of how you need really strong multi-party backing. I tried to go through it. First of all, you need the partnership with Azerbaijan and the recipient companies, notably BP. Then you need the market. 
So you need the European Commission to help you find that market. But above all, you need the big German companies who actually want to import the gas or Italian. Now, there are some markets in Southeast Europe that could also take it. But to do that, you've actually got to go out and find them, which is exactly what SOCAR did in the run-up to the 2013 investment decisions. And it's the kind of thing that the Turkmens have never managed to do. Then you have to have the political cover. But before we come to the political cover, uh, let me just do the one point on climate change. The 5 PCM that Turkmenistan could unleash almost immediately, most of it, quite possibly all of it, is currently being flared or vented. So immediately, you get a benefit to the climate. And it fits in with programs that the UK has backed to help Turkmenistan reduce emissions. So there's a UK stake in this. And then there's a the bigger political stake. Who provides the security to cover against Russia? Answer, US, but not in a terribly major way in terms of projection of force or anything like that. No, more modest, a little bit of financing to show that the US supports the concept. The real heft would have to come from Turkey. Bearing in mind old connections, the 1999 Memorandum of Understanding, letter of interest, some say it's an actual valid contract but with Botash, that if Turkmenistan can deliver gas to the Turkish border, Turkey will definitely buy it. You have President Erdogan only two weeks ago when Sardar Berdi Bahamadov, the president of Turkmenistan, was visiting Turkey. Erdogan said afterwards, we did discuss Turkmen gas supplies to Turkey. Silence from the Turkmen side. That's the real worry. Everything seems to be put out for them and they don't seem to bite. But if anyone's going to get them to bite, I think it would be Turkey. So anyway, what else have I got to say? Renewables, very quickly. Lots of good work being done in Azerbaijan and, and Kazakhstan on development of renewables. But it primarily has to be thought of in terms of internal development. The biggest thing that Kazakhstan can do is start working out how it can harness renewables to replace coal because coal is its great source of emissions. As for Azerbaijan, it has giant projects for renewables, not just for the Karabakh, which they've liberated, but also for export. It wants to have multiple cables, high voltage, ultra high voltage cables across the Black Sea into Europe. I'm not quite sure the feasibility for that has yet been established. And finally, hydrogen. Kazakhstan has, there are reports, let me get this correct, in Kazakh newspapers of projects to develop as much as 50 billion worth of hydrogen renewable energy in Kazakhstan to produce no less than 40 gigawatts of renewable energy. An absolutely stunning 270,000 square kilometers of land has been set aside in Mangistau for wind and solar. The goal is to produce 2 million tons a year of hydrogen. But if you read 
the brochures of the Amer German Swedish company Sevin trying to do this, it's quite clear that they're looking for export. And it's extraordinarily difficult to see how you can export vast volumes of hydrogen because it, that really would need a dedicated pipeline system to Europe. And that is what German officials have told me the Kazakh want to do. But you can use quite a bit of that domestically. And I think the one thing that is most important is that if you read all the reports about all of this that have been going on for two years, you would get the feeling that this was already government policy. But it isn't. Government policy in Kazakhstan, as I understand it, is to take a decision on hydrogen development early next year, and that that decision will include how much is for domestic use and how much is for export. And that's a quite rational approach. The question is now whether Azerbaijan, which has plans for as much as 22 gigawatts of electricity focused on hydrogen, will do the same. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. John, thank you very much. That was fascinating. You posed a puzzle that it's worth pondering why uh, energy ties with the Caspian have not, not developed more since Russia's invasion. And you also introduced the bracing clarity of detail, which is always essential when we talk about energy, volumes, capacity, geology, and routes. So thank you for that. Uh, Yekaterina, um, could you offer your remarks, please? And maybe you'll follow up and develop some of John's themes. Uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. So thank you. Energy security, of course, is a very hot topic nowadays. I will talk uh, to you about the middle corridor, which is also as hot as, as energy security. Uh, you know, uh, as you can see on the map uh, uh, behind me, um, in, in red, you can see the middle corridor. Uh, it's uh, the Trans-Caspian route. Um, and uh, in the past, it competed with the uh, sea shipments from China to Europe and with the Northern Corridor, which goes via Russia and Belarus. Uh, so if if you just look on the map, uh, you know, the middle corridor is much shorter than, than other routes. The sea route is about 20,000 kilometers. The northern route is 10,000 kilometers. And the middle corridor is only 7,000. But why it wasn't popular in the past? It because you have to cross many borders and also you have to change the modes of transport. You have to change from rail to ships, then again to rail or maybe road, and then again, you know, to ships. So it, it, it was a very complex way of delivering goods uh, from China to, to Europe. Uh, but it's uh, it's uh, emerging now as an alternative route. It's becoming very popular, and uh, you know, lots of people are thinking how to make it work, how to make it more efficient. Uh, how to basically decrease the number of days your goods have been shipped, uh, you know. But also, it's not only becoming important from basically getting getting goods from China, but also for Central Asia, it's very important, you know, because it's a part of Central Asian connectivity. How to connect Central Asia with Europe? So we in the European Bank, and I'm a banker, uh, we looked recently uh, into this topic very thoroughly. We developed with the uh, uh, EU a study on Central Asian connectivity. And this study looked at exactly what is the best route within the middle corridor? What is the best route? And we looked at three options uh, and they're all in red uh, on your screen. They're, they're, they're basically the route that, that goes uh, via uh, uh, north of Kazakhstan. Then the second one, which goes with the south of Kazakhstan and the third one, which is goes uh, through Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And the study basically looked at the country assessments, looked at traffic assessment, um, uh, also infrastructure assessment, what is already available there, uh, as well as social environmental aspects and economic integration aspect. And as a result of the study, uh, uh, it was confirmed that the center part of the route is the most efficient. You know, why is that? Because lots of infrastructure is already there. You don't have to invest too much. 
uh, this route basically goes through the most populous areas, connects four most populous cities in the region. It's also very close to uh, well-developed border crossing points. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, it's very close, so basically close to industrial centers of production centers, we call them. So they're in the catchment area of the central part of the Trans-Caspian route. So as part of this study, we looked at regional integration, we looked at ways of what needs to be done to make it uh, better, what investments are needed and what soft measures are needed. So as a result of the study, 39 actions have been identified as priority actions. 32 of them are investment projects for 18.5 billion euros and seven are soft connectivity measures. Uh, so, and, and again, we looked at, uh, you know, the financial viability of projects, their bankability, ease of implementation, uh, trade benefits for the region and for each country, um, alignment of projects with national priorities and uh, also donor priorities, and of course, environmental benefits and geopolitical benefits. So in terms of the soft measures, so what are these? Uh, they're in relation to tariffs, harmonization of procedures, of standards, uh, you know, increasing capacity, um, uh, but also supporting private sector. So for example, we looked at development of PPPs as part of this uh, soft connectivity measures. Uh, in terms of investments, and that's very important. So what are these 32 uh, you know, investments for 18 and a half billion euros? If we look at Kazakhstan, so where the bottleneck is, the bottleneck is around Almaty. So the first and foremost uh, priority investment is the Almaty Rail Bypass that I know the government of Kazakhstan and the Kazakh Railway Company are, uh, you know, working on and trying to develop this project. You know, then a few roads like Shalkarbinel Road Rehabilitation, uh, then there are some railway projects, uh, uh, the Baza Maktaral Railway Project is a very important one uh, for this uh, central Trans-Caspian connectivity. And these are sort of short-term priorities. In the midterm, it's important to expand uh, uh, the Aktau port. Uh, you know, it's, it's a good port uh, and it has some, some spare capacity, but in the meantime, it has to be expanded. There should be dredging done, you know, in the Caspian there. Uh, you know, also what's important in the midterm is Almaty Hargos railway line. It needs double tracking, it needs electrification. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very, very important. That's Kazakhstan. Uh, in terms of other countries, if you look at the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, the priority uh, should be logistic centers around Bishkek and Osh. Uh, in the short in the short term, in the mid term, it could be the railway line, the Rugard Makmal Jalalabad railway line, but it's a large project for this small country. Uh, in Tajikistan, the focus should be more on logistic centers, Fatahabot um, uh, around Fatahabot. Uh, in Turkmenistan, I have to say, there is already good infrastructure in place. So Turkmen Bashi port is uh, relatively new, it has capacity, but the problem is it's not properly connected to neighboring countries. So what the Turkmen government should, fo should be focusing on and or investors is connecting uh, Turkmen Bashi port with the Kazakh border and with the Uzbek border and basically roads connecting and also you know logistic centers at the Kazakh uh, border at the Uzbek border needs to be uh, improved. Uh, in Uzbekistan, what's interesting, the country has been investing into its railway infrastructure for some time, so it's relatively good. Uh, but uh, uh, multimodal logistic centers are lacking, so some private sector investments uh, are needed there. Uh, you know, also, you know, they may need to consider additional railway lines. Uh, in in the in the mid term and in the longer term, uh, maybe um, expanding uh, Tashkent Samarkand railway line, which is a bit congested at the moment, and uh, uh, there was a freight going there and also passenger passengers as well, and also uh, maybe considering rehabilitating or building new Tashkent Samarkand and Tashkent Dijan roads, uh, including through PPPs. Uh, I have to say that we at the IBRD, we are helping the Uzbek government in developing uh, PPPs, and the Uzbek government is a bit strategic uh, on this. They have more than 100 projects in the PPP pipeline, and some of these middle quarter projects are part of the PPP pipeline. We are advising the Uzbek government on Tashkent Samarkand Road. I hope it will be put to the market 
either next year or latest 2025, but also other MDBs, they're also advising those big government on other projects. For example, the World Bank is doing Tashkent uh, and Dijan. So we expect more and more projects coming to the market for private sector to invest in in the coming years. Uh, uh, I have to say that as part of our mandate, uh, we uh, advised the Uzbek government to change the PP legislation, uh, as we did a number of years ago in Kazakhstan. And one of the projects in, in Kazakhstan that was already implemented as part of the middle quarter is uh, uh, Almaty Road Bypass, also called Bakat. This road uh, was done as a PPP, and it's already been, construct been constructed 18 months ahead of schedule. So a truly great example that private sector can deliver can deliver faster, uh, you know, than the government. Anyway, with all these investments, eighteen and a half billion dollar uh, billion euros, um, you know, what would be the results? What basically we can achieve here? At the moment, if we only take the central part of the middle corridor, uh, you know, this. Uh, um, uh, Transcaspian route going through Aktau. Last year, 18,000 uh, containers, uh, you know, were delivered on that on that part. You know, if the business continues as usual with no additional investment, you know, it will grow. The container <laughs> traffic will grow to 130,000 in 15 years. However, if we do all these investments for 18.5 billion euros, so the traffic can increase sevenfold. So there would be enough capacity to handle 865,000 containers. But that's, we are talking about east-west trade. But what about interregional trade? You know, all this, uh, all this additional infrastructure will also boost international, uh, interregional trade. And, uh, you know, can also absorb and support another 470,000 uh, containers. So altogether, you know, it can bring to the region 1.3 million containers per year. So, and that's basically what we're looking for here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you for reminding us in particular that the middle corridor comprises many routes. It's an important to make a precise assessment of which of those routes works best. I'm sure there'd be interest in what the EBRD plans to do now on the basis of this analysis. Uh, and finally, it's a, a great pleasure to uh, introduce Campbell Keir, who is a former senior executive of Shell, has a formidable leadership and operational experience in the energy sector in this region. Campbell. Gosh, Nigel, what an introduction. Um, yes, I was the CEO in Shell Kazakhstan from 2008 to 2015, so I know the region quite well. And it's interesting now to see how some of these projects are maturing or developing in the direction changes. But my favorite country at the moment is Azerbaijan because you have the Formula One in uh, Baku and I'm a big Formula One fan. I did get up in the morning to watch the Las Vegas Grand Prix. So um, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack to uh, some of the previous speakers. I'm gonna actually present some um, investment data. We're going to do a bit of follow the money. The Energy Industry Council has been around for about 80 years, and we have a very large database called uh, Data Stream. It keeps track of major commercial projects around the world. We are currently tracking 14,300 projects around the world uh, for oil and gas, renewables, nuclear, etc. Uh, they represent about $13.8 trillion worth of investments. And this is all private money, it's not government money. promises made about net zero we've heard about hydrogen my favorite phrase about hydrogen is is it a reality or a myth i'll leave you to decide about that yourself so here is some data of the 13 trillion dollars worth of projects that we track two-thirds of those projects are green you can call them green renewables or whatever one third of them are fossil fuel projects 
but it's the other way around when it comes to the capex. Two thirds of the capex is in the fossil fuel area and one third is in the green area. Of course, some of the projects that are announced like hydrogen, CCUS are in very early stages, so don't have fully developed um, uh, values yet. Many projects are announced um, and many green projects are announced, but they still lack finance solutions. So let's look at the final investment decision rate. So if you've got a fossil fuel project, the FID rate of approval of your project to go ahead runs at over 20%. But for green projects, it's 5% on average with much lower numbers for projects like carbon capture, uh, et cetera. There's a definite shift into away from green projects towards uh, fossil fuel projects. And why is that? This is particularly impacting the supply chain. Financing is available. If you read the FT yesterday, they said that uh, the fossil fuel companies have got a lot of cash and are able to raise a lot of cash. And there's no premium on borrowing money for fossil fuel projects at the moment. Operators and margins are better in fossil fuel projects. We all know that uh, margins in many renewable projects are slim. The project pipelines are more secure. Uh, a lot of the offshore wind projects you see in Europe are very lumpy. They are, and the recent UK round and US rounds both failed to attract new projects. That's why Tim Stern uh, said today that they're going to double the um, CFD uh, target price. So green projects are lumpy. People like projects that they can see. If you go into the board, they'd like to be able to predict where the projects are going. And some of the renewables companies like Siemens and Orsted are in a bit of financial difficulty. So it's proving challenging. The big thing I think for this meeting here, perhaps for governments, is permitting and approvals for green projects is challenging. On Sunday, Jeremy Hunt was talking on Laura Kunzberg's program and said, we're targeting to reduce approvals for infrastructure projects from 14 years to seven years. Well, 2030 is seven years away, so we better get our skates on. Um, so permitting and approvals for green projects is challenging for governments and local authorities. In Germany, they decided to close their nuclear power stations. Good, laudable reasons they did that and they're shifting to offshore uh, to onshore offshore wind. The trouble is that the wind is generated in a different place in Germany from where the nuclear power plants are. So they have to move the grid around and it's taking eight years to get approval to do new grids. So permitting and approvals, licensing, et cetera, is very important. Terms and conditions are not fully developed uh, in some green areas. Hydrogen is uh, one of those areas. So. John, uh, I fully agree with your observations on hydrogen, but if people develop those volumes of hydrogen, there's actually nowhere for it to go. There's no market. There's no market price either. So the volume of hydrogen is uh, uh, for the market is not there. The market simply couldn't consume that amount. So we are in the midst of this energy trilemma, keeping the lights on, keeping it affordable and sustainability. And certainly you see around the world, we see from our data, things have shifted away from the green agenda towards energy security. We all understand that and keeping it affordable. We all understand that. In the, the Caspian, what we can clearly see is that there's going to be a heavy emphasis on fossil fuel investment over the next decade. Um, Nobody is expecting fossil fuel production to decline anytime soon. It's probably by 2030 going to start to go into decline. But in the meantime, consumption has been driven by populations growing rapidly around the world, India and the Far East, and uh, growing economies in Africa. If you look at the growth rates potentially in Africa, they are huge and they, will, they need energy to, to, to grow and develop. Everybody wants a fridge, everybody wants air conditioning, everybody wants lighting on in the evenings. So I think fossil fuels will be here to stay. I think it's very laudable that governments have these ambitions. Our conclusion is that 2030 targets are very doable with existing technologies. And one of the ambassadors or councillors mentioned 
energy efficiency, energy. You can do a lot simply by making your current plants, refineries, whatever there are, more efficient rather than building brand new projects. But we're going to have to increase the pace at which things are done. We're going to have to attract more investment. The, the whole pace of it all has to increase. We can achieve 2050, although the target, the latest estimates from the UN is not 1.5, it's 2.8 degrees centigrade. It can all happen, but it requires governments to get aligned to attract the investors who will come if the opportunities are there, permitting, markets have to be developed, and the consumers have to want it. And I have to plead guilty myself. I was saying to somebody else recently, my wife has just bought a new car and she didn't buy electric because it was 19,000 pounds more expensive than the petrol equivalent. So she, being a good Northern girl, decided to, to go with the money and, and, and bought a petrol version of her BMW. So 2050, we think is achievable. The supply chain, the companies want to go. If you talk to companies, their employees want it. The younger generation want their companies to be green, but people at the moment are following the money. And I think the final word goes to the Secretary General of the United Nations who said, I paraphrase what he said, it's a very long speech. The era of global warming is over. The era of global boiling has begun. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Campbell. Uh, John set us up with a puzzle why there hasn't been uh, greater engagement since uh, Russia's evasion of Ukraine. Uh, Yekaterina set us up with uh, a possibility identifying the best of the middle corridor routes. And you have set up a problem for us. Mm -hmm. Why, if anything, has uh, investment shifted away from the green solutions? Uh, that's really fascinating food for thought. Uh, now, we started late, so I'm going to assert the right that we finished late. And I think so much has been raised uh, by all of the panelists that it's worth devoting just maybe five minutes to just a few key crisp questions. And I think that the corresponding loss of a few minutes of coffee is a more than acceptable price to pay for that. So could I ask, please, just for a few questions, keep them short and crisp, precise uh, and questions rather than comments, please. Yes. Thank you. I'd be interested to get any perspectives you may have on that, especially in terms of energy transportation and uh, any any thoughts on that. And if I could cheekily possibly ask a second question, which is the uh, about the falling water levels in the, especially in the in the North Caspian, vis-a-vis -vis transportation and the prospects for the uh, that you were discussing there for increasing. Um, uh, cargo and, and tanker movements across across the Caspian Sea. There's a bit of a competition. You've got two ports I can see on the map, um, Katrina, uh, Kureik and Aktau. Uh, I hear proponents of Kureik talking about how great it is to have kind of a new greenfield project there versus Aktau being very congested. Any thoughts perhaps on, on that would be of interest to me at least thank, thank you. you we'll gather a, a few more questions and we'll answer them in in a single burst anyone else want to spark yes please <clears throat> hello uh, ivan and carter project analyst i just want to have uh, an ask a question to the panel with regards to the uh, rising emergence of the BRICS um, economic bloc and with certain um, aspects of the OPEC plus nations or members of the OPEC plus organization factoring into that, whether or not um, the implications, for example, with Iran and Saudi Arabia potentially becoming new members of the BRICS, what implications this may have with regards to the energy security of Europe and in terms of the macroeconomic um, standing of the world. Very good. One final zinger out there. Going, going. Gone. All right, then. So, Zangozur, 
corridor water levels bricks who would like to address any of those Maybe I can just address this question about the, the Caspian, Octal versus Kurik. Uh, well, yes, both ports, they have future. And of course, there are discussions about constructing new oil terminals, for example, in Kurik. Uh, I guess it's more about delivering Kazakh oil uh, to Europe using alternative ways, right? So, but again, these are private sector projects that are driven by private sector. And if private investors are willing to invest, it means they are they are willing to basically, or they, they, they understand how they will get returns. So, but both projects are there, they're there, they're being developed. Mm -hmm. Water levels are more important for Agtau than for Kurik. Also, Kurik enables the, for every 10 Trans-Caspian oil tanker journeys to the BGC line from Aktau, you can do 11 from Kurik because it's a shorter distance. So you get a better return for your money or more to the point, you get more oil into the BTC pipeline, which if you're talking about marginal extra supplies at a time of shortages, that's quite important. The most important thing though about the Caspian and Caspian water is quite simply, do you really want to develop hydrogen when you consider how much water it requires and what the implications there are for the ecology of the Caspian if you're developing hydrogen as the Kazakhs would appear to be wishing to do in the Mangistar region, relying on Caspian seawater. Um, other question about the uh, Sangazo Corridor. Um, if there is a peace settlement with Armenia, it becomes a very sensible route for all kinds of traffic. Notably, the Azerbaijanis would like to have a railway there, and they'd like to have a road there. And uh, given that they have said in the past that if there were peace, they would be prepared to supply energy to Armenia, uh, they could do that via the corridor. But also take it the other way around. If there isn't a peace settlement, then if you wish to use the Zanzibar Corridor, either you have to seize control of it, which is, of course, technically possible. We know what the Azerbaijanis are capable of doing. Or you have to go on the Iranian side of the river, which is not going to be locked on very happily by shall we say, Europe and North America. So I think the Zanzibar is useful, but it's far more important to have an Azerbaijani-Armenian peace settlement, regardless of whatever use gets made of the corridor. Um, as regard, yeah, that's bad. As regard BRICS, it's really the question of Russia and China it's, you know, I don't see any particular role for any of the other BRICS members in this. And Russia and China is, in this context, the old-fashioned geopolitics of Eurasia. Well, the only comment I'd make is, as long as I've been involved in Kazakhstan, the argument about uh, Kurik versus Aktau as a port for development has been ongoing. I can't remember, Kurik is, gets, it stays ice-free, if I remember. And I, th all right. I, I think that's the most important factor. And I always remember that I never know if it's if the Caspian is water level is dropping or not. Nobody ever seems to know. Maybe the councillor knows. Uh, but I do know that when the wind blows from the north, this is very odd, the water moves from the north of the Caspian to the south. In fact, so much so that Kashagan, boat, boats getting into Kashagan can have some problems. Uh, so there's a lot going on there, meteorologically speaking, and I'm not qualified to talk about it, but I do think Kurik is the ice-free one, I, I think. So that is a very important factor in Kazakhstan. Yep. Oh, thank you very much to all our panelists for a really terrific discussion. Uh, you've all identified some, some devils in the detail. Uh, it remains uh, for them to be exercised. 
Uh, that's a great policy and commercial challenge. Perhaps for the next generation. Uh, we have you have to drink your coffee a little faster, but I think that's a small price to pay. But before we do that, uh, let's thank our panelists. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I can get your attention for this last panel of the day, you know, two years ago, there was never a mention of the middle corridor. Now it's on everyone's lips. And I think it's an example of how fast things are moving and how fast things can happen in this rapidly evolving region. This is not your grandmother's Central Asia, nor her Caucasus. The Caspian region is rapidly changing. And for those of us who deal with policy and development, we actually have to work harder to understand and to keep up with the changes that are taking place in this part of the world at this point in time. Now, today we're talking about energy security. And, you know, this is an energy rich region if ever there was one. Um, you know, why on earth are all of these countries interested in decarbonization? Well, I mean, I would have to say the, the, the Caspian region, when you look at both Central Asia and the Caucasus, it's, it's a region that is both blessed and cursed. Uh, there are vast reserves of gas, oil, coal, those kinds of things that we're eventually looking to change and, and evolve from. But there's also ample opportunity for hydro, solar, wind. Now, hydro, as we look at this region, we are seeing climate change rear its ugly head. And we see the, as we've heard mentioned earlier, the waters of the Caspian going down. The Aral is, is virtually a, a puddle at this point. Um, we've seen the, the impact of, of Soviet legacies that this region has to deal with. And we see because of that, um, a shaky energy grid. We see agriculture diverting waters. We see um, coal mines leaking methane. This is a region that's challenged by its past as it tries to move forward. And so one of the things we're exploring today here is, you know, what does it take to achieve an energy transition how do we make that energy transition be affordable and sustainable? Really complex questions that we, we, we wrestle with. So um, I'll briefly introduce our, our panel here. I'm Eric Rudenschold. I am the, uh, I'm a senior advisor here at the Caspian Policy Center. I have a PhD from the University of Virginia. Uh, I've worked for all sorts of international organizations over the years, UNDP, OSE. Most recently, I worked with the United States as a National Security Council Director for Central Asia. Um, and today, I have the pleasure of, of introducing uh, our expert panel and leading discussions in this, uh, this challenging arena. And we'll start first with Aida Siddikova. She is EBRD's Energy Director for a diverse group of transitional countries uh, in Eurasia, the Middle East and Africa. She's got 20 plus years of experience in public and private sector development and emerging markets, uh, including what de debt equity, uh, financing, syndications, and government policy dialogue. Uh, she holds an international finance specialty with MBA, from the prestigious Thunderbird School uh, and a CFA designation. She, uh, currently, Aida is spearheading, if I am not mistaken, the policy engagement with these respective governments on decarbonization, renewables, cost-effective tariffs, and other sectors as well. We'll also have on the panel, Dr. John Merton. He's a senior sustainability advisor for the Char Standard Charter Bank. Uh, along with a distinguished foreign service career as ambassador to six African nations. Um, he served as the UK government's COP26 envoy. He's leading the charge on blending financing efforts, and he's led G7 negotiations in the Just Energy Transition Partnerships with uh, uh, 
uh, South Africa and Vietnam, and we'll offer congratulations, uh, late congratulations, uh, for uh, his having been awarded the Companion of the Order of St. George, uh, St. Michael and George by King Charles for his services to foreign policy and the climate. We have Eugene Sierre, who is the Chief Operations Officer for the Port of Baku, uh, leading infrastructure planning and systems development of this rapidly growing international sea trade port. He brings a wealth of experience from management of two premier Singapore ports to terminals in the Middle East and China. He's a recognized expert in infrastructure planning, systems management, and automation of operations. And last but not least, Barish Altaparmak is the general director of Colin Azerbaijan and the Azerbaijani representative to the World Turkish Business Council. He holds an MSc from the Istanbul Technical University um, Barish is also has certificates and training in strategic development and energy from the London School of Business and ADA University. He's an experienced energy project manager and he brings 20 years uh, of intimate knowledge of energy markets in Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and North Africa. Uh, He's been recognized uh, in ENR's top international contractors as best global projects, and he's managed diverse programs, including for the US Millennium Challenge Corporation in Georgia, bringing a deep knowledge of Caspian energy to the discussion today. So uh, without further ado, I would like to ask Aida to give us uh, her presentation. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. Indeed, I cover um, a diverse region, diverse set of countries. So it goes from Mongolia to Morocco with Kazakhstan in between. All three are very heavy dependent on coal. So unsurprisingly, the bank's green agenda is focused on energy transition in these and other countries in between. Um, when we say energy agenda, we of course are talking about energy security and climate change as a twin challenge. We don't see these two as mutually exclusive. We're actually thinking energy, energy transition is supportive um, of energy security. In that sense, EBRD um, is committed to have all of our projects aligned with the objectives of the Paris Agreement as of January this year. So especially in the energy sector, that means a lot of constraints of what the bank can do but it's also responsive to the challenges of the outside world. 50% of our projects have to be green and it's sort of, it's not whatever definition, it's a very rigorous MDB joint methodology under which projects are screened. Um, so this year it coincides that we are uh, developing our new energy strategy for the next five year period. And the overwhelming theme there is basically electrify everything, electrify economies, electrify, uh, try to electrify hard to bait sectors and electrification should be done with clean energy sources. So when we talk about clean energy sources, of course, the, the, core, the core attention is on renewables. And I'll get to what we do in renewables in the Caspian region, but basically um, we see renewables as, a, as an answer to the energy trilemma of sustainable, secure, affordable. So we don't think with renewables, there is actually any trilemma. Um, you can't weaponize renewables. Uh, renewables are supportive of cross-border, like gas, for example, we've been discussing in the previous session. Um, renewables facilitate cross-border trade, interconnections. Renewables do have an issue. The renewables need grids. The renewables need to be dispatchable. And this is something we are also working on while scaling up, while moving the renewables from megawatts to gigawatts um, in, the, in the Caspian region and broader EBRD uh, countries. Of course, we are guided, we're all in the run up to COP28, where the message will be triple renewables, double energy efficiency, slash methane leakages by 75% and triple climate findings. And this is sort of our guiding principles as well. So in the air, in the region of Central Asia and Caucasus, which are part of the, of course, Turkey, part of middle corridor, the focus is on energy transition. How can we help these um, carbon intensive economies to decarbonize? And why would we do that, given Kazakhstan has 300 years of coal reserves, which they can continue burning? 
and it's cheap and it's all on the surface. So why, why, why do energy transition? Why work with the government on the low carbon pathway for the energy sector? Or Uzbekistan, who's got gas, can also continue burning it. So the question is more on why they should be doing it. And we sort of firmly believe that there is a cost of carbon um, implicit in everything they do. Yes, there is CBAM coming. Uh, so exporters and the economies will be facing this challenge. Uh, apart from the, all the, the good stuff, the, the climate change, the CO2 emissions, local pollutants. And we see this as an opportunity, not as a threat to start, to start reducing of carbon. Uh, banks wouldn't take carbon or would be taking very reluctantly carbon on their books. There's a risk of carbon lock-in with big infrastructure projects uh, related, for example, to gas. Uh, there is a stranded assets risk. Would that gas pipeline be needed in 40 years? So these are the things that we're, we finance Southern Gas Corridor. My team financed Southern Gas. So we, we have, uh, it was five years ago, uh, more than five years ago. But we also uh, had a, even then had a very clear decarbonization agenda of that gas replacing coal, for example, in the West Balkans. So energy transition is not an easy issue uh, in middle corridor, in the middle corridor, but it's something that countries are waking up to. Um, we and and work with us. We financed 2.7 gigawatts of renewables in Uzbekistan in just in less than four years. Um, it's um it's with sponsors from the Gulf. It's from European with European sponsors, but people do see this enabling environment that allows them to move from megawatts to gigawatts. We financed 800. We financed the first Kazakh renewables in 2014, actually with a UK sponsor. So we have some some expertise in that area. We moved to we just in the in last year and this year we financed the first two renewable large utility scale in Azerbaijan. This is the country that is looking to do more. Uh, of renewables for um, for experts. So overall, I think the region has huge capacity to drive the regional decarbonization. They need to scale up renewables. They will have to address the issue of grids. And here, the issue of grids should again be looking should should be looked at in a cross regional context. We have two hydro-rich countries. We have Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, for example, that may be outside of the pyramid of middle corridor. But they then we have fossil fuel countries, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So there is historical interconnection and Soviet legacy system connections. Um, but they need to build new new transmission capacity to balance um, to balance renewables, intermittent renewables, and ensure energy security because some of them are still importing expensive balancing power from Russia. Um, we are, of course, looking at this sort of cross-Caspian connection. We are very aware of the overall potential that the region has to export green. Um, it could be green electricity, and we've heard about the Black Sea um, submarine cable, where um, Georgia and Azerbaijan, for example, are looking to transmit it to Europe, uh, Turkey potentially joining it. We look at the Trans-Caspian subsea cable, early stage, but again, these are the things that will help monetize the green power of the, of the region. <clears throat> um, we financed a similar project, which is called CASA 1000. It's in the region, so part of middle corridor. And this is um, exports of clean hydropower from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to Pakistan via via Afghanistan. Very difficult infrastructure project, but hopefully there was a learning curve that uh, for MDBs and for governments um, to, to um, do something similar with involvement of the Caspian. Uh, I completely agree with the previous speakers on the previous panel that Turkey will have to be a big player in, the, in whatever the setup for the energy interconnections um, the region takes on. And it could be it could be a lot of things. It could be hydrogen. Uh, we financed, and we are a bit more optimistic than the previous panel, I guess. Of course, it's a question how how you carry energy. Is it molecules? Is it electrons? Do you build transmission line or do you transport hydrogen? Hydrogen transportation is a big problem. We don't we all know that. 
ammonia is less of a problem and could be easily easier monetized. But when we financed our first hydrogen project was in Egypt, post COP 27, uh, it was a steep learning curve for bankers, uh, for developers, for uh, electrolyzer producers. I think the key point there, and we're looking at one actually in Uzbekistan, at one, um, it's not 40 gigawatt in Mangi style by Svevin, but it's something a bit more manageable and hopefully something easier to be done. So the key points there is the insured offtake. Um, it's the water issue. Scarcity of water is a big issue, especially say Mongistau, they will have to look at the green desalination. It's also compliance with the taxonomies of the destination markets, which is EU in this case. Um, these are the things that will have to be addressed. But overall, the region offers enormous opportunities for decarbonization, um, and I hope they will be taken up by international investors and by the governments. Thank you. Aida, thank you. Lots of food for thought in that panel. Um, let's just simply say, electrify everything and you cannot weaponize renewables. I mean, two great quotes right there. Thank you so much. John Merton, you are now up, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very conscious there are some former Foreign Office colleagues in the room who will be looking at me thinking, what on earth is he doing here um, speaking about the Caspian when I've never set foot in the Caspian? Uh, and that's not my area of geographic expertise. But I do know a little bit about energy systems and energy transitions. And so hopefully if I share some of that with you, you'll, you'll be able to sort of interpret how that might impact uh, geopolitics uh, in the Caspian and will shed some light on the debate. And, and I suppose my main thesis is really the, the, the question in the, in the panel title, how to achieve sustainable, affordable and secure energy transition, almost presupposes that transition is something you might do if you chose to, and if you felt it was in your interests. And, and, and I would argue actually, energy transition will happen. Uh, it will happen more swiftly than many people uh, would, would, would commonly realize. Uh, uh, it will happen with quite a noticeable geography as it evolves, and there are things that you can do to prepare yourself for the transition. So in terms of it happening swiftly, uh, I would argue that, um, the, that we are in the middle of a great technological S-curve. And by an S-curve, I mean uh, a curve that begins slowly, uh, and increases very fast and then levels out uh, as, as adoption of, of the technology is complete. Uh, and we're in the middle of technological S-curves for renewable energy. We're in the middle of technological S-curves for battery uh, and other forms of storage technology. And we're in the middle of um, S-curves for uh, uh, zero emission vehicles. Um, and I'll give you my favorite example of an S-curve is, is the, the ice industry in North America. Um, in the late part of the 19th century, uh, the cutting of ice from lakes in Canada and its distribution to the south of the USA so to, to cool your drink or to, to keep your medicines uh, fresh was the fifth largest industry in the United States of America. And in the space of about three years, it was destroyed by the uh, invention of a machine where you could create ice using electricity. And that it completely eliminated the need to cut and, and move ice around the world. And I would argue that we're on, on the sort of verge of something quite similar happening in the sphere of electricity, because um, the cost of new solar projects around the world has, has, has been a bit of a, a bump recently uh, because of supply chain issues, and, and that was well picked up on. But um, the cost of solar energy projects around the world has been as low as one and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the cost of transmission of electricity in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, is two and a half cents uh, a kilowatt hour, which means that now it is possible to generate solar electricity, uh, perhaps on your rooftop or on your factory site at the site of consumption, more cheaply than anybody can send it down a wire to your factory. Uh, and that's a transformative technology, very akin to the example I, I raised with ICE, and it's leading to a massive build out of solar and wind uh, around the world. And and Keir quoted some, some Campbell quoted some, some figures which were, were, were helpful in terms of understanding financial flows, but the reality on the ground is over the last year, 
80% of new generation capacity added worldwide was wind and solar. Uh, and so that may not be reflected in capital flows as, as his figures quoted, but the, in terms of added generation capacity, uh, the vast majority is now wind uh, and solar and those stocks are, are only going to continue to increase. And we're seeing the same with battery storage and we're saying the same with zero emission vehicles. Um, uh, it wasn't a couple of years ago that zero emission vehicles in the UK had a market share of 2%. Um, their market share is growing about 60% a year. Uh, if you have a 2% market share and you grow at 60% a year, in seven years, you have more than half of the market. Uh, and that is a really transformative uh, technological impact on a market. And that's why Tesla, which was not a motor vehicle manufacturer until 13 years ago, uh, is now the most valuable mo motor vehicle manufacturer in the world because markets are anticipating that future that they see um, not so far away. And I think we're going to see these trends uh, snowball and accelerate. And as a consequence of that, you see now in China, 45% of uh, vehicle sales in China are battery electric vehicles. And Sinopec, the Chinese uh, oil and uh, state owned oil firm, has said that China has now passed peak oil because the demand for oil in China is reducing because the stock of battery electric vehicles has, has hit a sufficiently high level and their utilization has hit a sufficiently high level that demand for oil in uh, China is beginning to fall. So arguably we are we are passing peak oil. Uh, we're passing peak coal and we will soon, no doubt, um, pass peak gas. And in addition to those technological trends, you, of course, as, as Ada mentioned, you have the, the weight of government policy behind you. You have carbon pricing now um, being increasingly present in, in a number of markets that is adding to those trends. And you have the prospect of carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which means that even if you don't have carbon pricing in your own market, it'll be imposed uh, on products as they're imported into the European Union uh, and in future in other markets. And so that's going to push technology uh, really fast. Um, and it's going to mean that there's going to be a falling demand for oil and gas, and that fall in demand will not be evenly uh, impactful across the world. The, the producers that will be affected first are the highest marginal cost producers, because once the, uh, the cost of your production becomes uncompetitive, you will fall away first if you are the highest marginal cost producer. And basically, under any scenario, Saudi Arabia will be the last oil producer standing. That's that's kind of baked in on account of their, their marginal cost of production. So I would encourage you to think about that and think about where does your country stand in terms of marginal cost of production? What does it mean um, for your industries? And it's important that we prepare for this coming energy transition early in order to make it orderly. Because when you prepare early for a change, uh, it can happen in an orderly fashion uh, and you stay ahead of the curve. If it happens late, quick, if it happens in a disorderly fashion, uh, then it can be really disruptive. And, and I grew up in the minor strike in the UK. That was a politically motivated change away from coal generation in the UK, but it was quick and dramatic and it had huge social consequences. And that will be true in many, many energy producing countries uh, around the world. Um, so I would just sort of leave it there in saying that the um, the energy transition, I think, will happen more swiftly than many people anticipate. It will have geographical impacts, and it's important for us all to, to be really conscious of that uh, as we plan our economies and make sure that we're not essentially investing now in assets that will very rapidly become stranded. Uh, and to, to wrap up, I just point you to the words of a, a wise former Saudi Arabian oil minister who noted that the Stone Age didn't end because we've run out of stones and the oil age will not end because we run out of oil. It'll end because we find something that's cheaper, cleaner uh, uh, and more suited to our needs in the current day. Thank you. John Merton, thank you. Our future is bright. Um, some really interesting uh, concepts about the energy transition and transformative technologies impact. Thank you. So we turn the, the uh, microphones to Eugene, uh, who can talk to us in depth about the, uh, the Caspian region. I'll just start off by saying, for me personally, I do not think the future is so bright from my perspective. Uh, all due respect, John. I think they will make the discussion more interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will talk first about the RLC, which was mentioned previously. RLC for the last three decades has been desiccated by mismanagement, poor agricultural policies, excessive use 
of pesticides, chemicals for cotton industry. And what is happening now? Winds are blowing now from east to west. Sorry, yeah, west, yeah, east to west. Okay, and you know, Tenshan Mountains right behind the ROC is being affected. The glaciers are melting. There's less condensation, condensation and less moisture. Mm. But why is impact climate change is even more serious? You find these chemicals that RO does has gone across to the Antarctic, to Norway, Norway even, and to the Greenlands. Recently, there was a study done on the factors affecting Caspian Sea. And one of the things they found was the type of wind going across the Caspian Sea has less moisture. Could this be because of the ROC? It could be, because there are so many factors now happening in the global climate change system that we can't really put a constant to some and say that this really is the cause. But the real impact is when they measure the temperature at Volgodon region, it's more than two degrees for the last 10 years has been risen. So in that part of the world, in summer, it's very hot. And this has impacted temperatures, evaporation. So there's less water flowing into the Caspian Sea. 16 meters, gentlemen, ladies, RLC has dropped. 16. Three quarters of the water has disappeared. The Caspian water surface is 371,000 square kilometers. How much of this will drop? Studies have shown the, from the 21st century onwards, it could be also 16 meters. This will affect ports in Aktau more than us in the middle corridor. But it will affect the middle corridor because the whole levels of the seas will drop. So what is Port Baku doing? In view of this, we embark on the strategy of climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Behaviors must change. Systems must change. We have to go on to renewables. So on climate adaptation, we went on the eco port certification, changed the mindset of people, use less resource, go for efficiency, use less factors of production to reduce the use rates of fossil fuel. So we got eco cert, you know, everybody is happy. But we should not stop from there. And, but the good thing is that our behavior instituted uh, more changes in the region. So Aptal Port also went to OSC. They got funding from EU and they also went on change and they got also echo port certification. So I think in the big picture is that collectively behaviors change, you will have some impact on the climate. And then it comes to climate mitigation. Climate mitigation, we have for three to four years look at projects to use hydrogen, to use ammonia, to create a circular economy, right? But the, the point is, you know, cost of, fossil fuel, cost of the fossil fuel is still more cheaper than hydrogen and ammonia. So there's this, you know, thing about sustainability in terms of commercial. Um, but we are not giving up. We are still looking at it. Some of the things we are looking at it is looking at renewables to produce electrolysis of water, to get hydrogen, then under the haber botch process to produce green ammonia, and then to store it in our fertilizer uh, silos that we're going to be built. But that's still the commercial part. Um, John Burton brought up the issue of using water to produce hydrogen. Well, to produce hydrogen, I won't go into details. There are many ways to do this. One is a steam reforming process that, you know, you use natural gas. So that's considered, uh, no, not so good hydrogen. They call it, no, gray hydrogen. But if you use carbon capture technologies to capture the carbon emissions, then you call it blue hydrogen. If you use renewable energy to produce hydrogen from greens, from renewables like solar, which I think the Kazakhs are doing, then you get completely green hydrogen. 
one of the ways I think also, I'm not talking for Kazakhs, but I look at it, uh, what the Kazakhs are doing is actually to el elevate this fuel um, energy security problem is also to produce fertilizer, green ammonia fertilizer, because all the plants in uh, Europe, the chemical plants in Europe, they don't get any more natural gas, they shut down. So all these chemical plants don't produce any of the fertilizers anymore. So this one way where I think one more usage where Kazakhstan can come in to help on the energy security part. But going to back to Port of Baku, if we take all the emissions generated by vessels all over the world and aggregate them, we find that as we can postulate that as a country for this, it's the sixth largest emission contributor. Same for the Caspian Sea, you know, you micro it down and look at all the vessels in the Caspian Sea. They're old, they're Soviet built, they use poor, very thick black diesel. You know, if you see the, um, the, the Soviet Union has an aircraft carrier, right? You don't need to use radar to look at it. You can see the black smoke coming out from 10 miles away. You know the Soviets are coming with the aircraft carrier because they use black diesel, you know. The, so, same for Caspian, the ships are very, some of them, oh, we have a few new ships coming in. I think um, Kazakhstan is going to build, uh, and Turkmenistan are aggressive uh, to build uh, new vessels, more than 10 for Turkmenistan. I think Kazakhstan has got Abu Dhabi with them, some JVs and going on to build more vessels. And also Baku Shipyard is also in to build more vessels. I hope, I, in terms of financing, uh, John, that when these vessels are built, they can look into new technologies. They can look into hydrogen. They can look into ammonia. I mean, put your money where your mouth is. Huh? Okay, you want to have a great impact on the region, then do it where it matters most. That's the vessels. You know, the next is the trucks. They're coming in. At any one point in the port, we have about 500 trucks, you know, because the railways are not so developed yet. We see increasingly more and more cargo being thrown to the trucks. Okay, for the middle corridor. That's sad to say, but I, I think it's a, it's a temporary uh, kind of a uh, measure. Um, going forward, I think we also try to keep in pace with the, the Azerbaijan government because the Azerbaijan government has a, has a policy of, uh, you know, they want to cut down emissions by a certain percentage by 2040. Baku, Port Baku has more ambition. We say we want to cut down emissions by 2035, zero emissions. Uh, so we folk try to fall in line to create all these projects that we have. And uh, for now, okay, I leave it at this point for my fellow speakers to carry on. We can always count on Eugene for for the nitty gritty. I appreciate very much uh, your being able to help us really understand why the countries of this region are very much in favor of decarbonization, even though they are producers of carbon uh, fuels. Um, the temperature increase, the, the water decline, these are all really shocking and moving data points. Thank you so much. And now uh, I, I turn to Barish for, for the final penultimate, oh, the, the final statement. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. First of all, um, let me confess something. Because when I started to prepare my speech, it was uh, for four pages. And whenever uh, similarly discussed, then I started to delete it and nothing left. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, yeah, by the way, uh, it is something becoming disadvantage or advantage for being the last of this panel. But I will just make it much more easy for all of us. Start from the end. Um, when the completing of my speech, I was planning to give this message and then I will start from the end. Uh, we discussed lot, lots of things about what to do. And it would be, of course, uh, essence to discuss how we do as, as well. And 
the how, if we are talking about regional security, and in the region, if we are talking about the lots of stakeholders we are talking about, the only thing would succeed for our targets is to cooperate. So cooperation supposed to be our the essence target uh, to ensure for our regional energy security. I'm telling our because um, starting from the uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan's cooperation, I will discuss and give some key points about my discussions as well. And it, we are sure that it will reflect for the region and the regional prosperity, of course, will affect for the uh, energy security of the Europe as well. Yeah, just uh, very quickly, I will uh, uh, sort it out from my notes that, uh, of course, uh, as 2023, it is really so uh, important year for our region and uh, all of us. It, it is because the uh, there are two cent sentinels uh, for Republic of Turkey uh, and also uh, we are celebrating the national leader of Azerbaijan's Haidelary, whom we celebrate 100th anniversary. And of course, I'm so glad to have this opportunity to discuss here in London with the CPC. I really appreciate all CPC teams and leaders' invitation for joining here. And by the way, yes, uh, myself, that I've been living in Azerbaijan for more than 16 years period of time, and I'm nearly two decades so proud for being in witnessing steady improvement of the Azerbaijan in the region. We discussed a lot about the uh, major impacts, what we have been so far uh, witnessed, of course, started with the pandemic. Uh, we were together with John last year in Baku with the Baku Summer Energy School. Uh, at that time, I remember that I started my speech in the energy school that the, during the pandemic, uh, what the lovely things that we were discussing together with the John. For example, it was uh, 2017 when again we were together with John. We were discussing about uh, LNG versus pipeline dependency, independency, or so on. Just after two years later, we were again discussing with the John. John was in uh, together with uh, his uh, grandson. And uh, we both were discussing uh, how we can go out from the home. Even he was in London, I was in Baku. Uh, so the things are changing so rapidly. But then after four years later, again, we are back and we are uh, getting out from our homes and discussing it again for the energy issues. So uh, why I'm telling this? Uh, yeah. Of course, the major things that we have been discussing so far from international relations of the foreign affairs point of view. But of course, on the other hand, we all are as human beings, uh, 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 even personal relations are directly affecting for our international relations as well. Uh, coming back again for what are the developments in our region? Um, yeah, by the way, maybe just to avoid for about the confusions, I'm originally from Turkey and I'm representing my uh, uh, company, Calling Construction. That the Calling Construction is the Turkish energy and construction company uh, for a 50 years period of time, globally dealing with the energy and the infrastructure projects. And from the NGO point of view, I'm representing the Tur World Turkish Business Council here in Azerbaijan. And considering my uh, Azerbaijan experience also, I'm having a uh, 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 privilege to discuss about the regions from the Azerbaijan's perspective. So that's why from the development's point of view, uh, as we are talking about the energy transition, Azerbaijan declared about the green zone plan, uh, especially in Nahchivan and the Karabakh. Uh, uh, of course, with the developments of the new uh, 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 free economic zones and the uh, uh, new technology zones there in Azerbaijan. And very recently in 2020, Azerbaijan in Turkey has declared internationally um, broadly allied countries. So it's also uh, becoming more supportive action for integration of the uh, 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 two countries from the foreign affairs point of view. Um, and uh, for many years, Azerbaijan and Turkey energy cooperation has regional and international importance. And uh, our countries are 
considered as a reliable and strategic partners in Europe's energy supply. Uh, for uh, uh, next vision and the next turn point of view, as we discussed about, of course, the, the governmental uh, uh, plans and the visions what we have, and from the private sector point, point of view, we also would like to highlight about the importance of the uh, public-private partnerships projects and uh, together with working with the financial institutions. Uh, whereas uh, uh, I would also, while completing my remarks about the, these issues, um, as it is also even from the UK government, it seems that the regional financial institutions are ready to uh, separate some uh, uh, financing budgets uh, for the region. Um, trilateral, trilateral cooperation and the contracts can be done together with the, uh, uh, the public-private partnerships projects as well. So uh, while coming to the end, I would like to also mention about the uh, uh, for empowering Caspian region, we should act as the coordinated integrated and effective cooperation, which, which is a regional prosperity, will support the energy security as well as for the euro. Thank you so much. Wow, lots to chew on from this panel. Um, Aida noted for us the implicit cost of carbon. John talked about change is coming rapidly and there's the need for preparation for economies to address this challenge or miss the boat. Eugene talked about the huge impact of climate change as it's motivating the, the innovations in the Trans-Caspian Seaways uh, in particular. Barish here talks about critical cooperations in the region and how governments and private sector need to innovate where we see such things as, as green zones. I mean, really innovative kind of thinking, but this is the kind of thinking that's critical for the Caspian, the broader Caspian region to address climate change at this point. Now I'm cognizant of our time and the fact that uh, an absolutely delightful lunch I am, I'm assured is waiting for you behind the, the glass doors. So um, I'll turn this over to all of you. Um, if you have questions that, uh, need asking, we stand ready to address them at this point. Any questions from the audience for this this panel? Uh, lunch beckons, I can, uh, ah, here's one. Oh my goodness. The microphone comes, tension builds. It's a, a question for Barris. Um, Last time we met, you were talking about the ability of Colin to develop tankers on the Caspian. Is this a potential solution for improving Kazakhstan's ability to export oil, uh, or rather uh, to take it from Aktau or Kurik and ship it over to enter the BTC line? Thank you for the question, Robert. Um, as a, our group of companies, um, we are the biggest vessel producer in the region. And in general, there are type of the vessels, as you might already know, that the one, the military purpose, the vessels are being produced and the one for the maintenance purpose and the new for the new vessels for the uh, logistics use. And we are the uh, we have capability and the experience who are the only one uh, using and being produced these three different types of the vessels in one hour shipyard, the biggest in Turkey. And yes, you are right. We still have keen intention to move our this international experience into Azerbaijan. And we have uh, existing discussions ongoing together with the ministries and the relevant authorities. Again, I will, I think we are on the record, but I will tell something off the record. Uh, <laughs> so it is sometimes we can chicken and egg. Do you know why? Because yes, we have intention to produce new vessels in the Caspian region, but to start for the new investment and start for the production itself and the fabrication itself, 
in the same time, we shall find the uh, customer who should give the order as well. So we shall come to the Caspian from the Marmara Sea together with our client and investment together. So now I'm still challenging to find both in the same time. So this is the situation. Can I add to that? The for vessels throughput in operation terms, you can only do so much, okay? Maybe about 300,000, 250,000 barrels per day. And the size of the vessel matters. Right now, you have 12,000 day weight tons. But I think there was even talk of making more efficient of about 60,000 day weight tons. That's where, that's where the problem comes in with the falling sea levels or that. That's why there's a problem now on deciding even the type of vessels. And it should only serve as a short-term measure. I think the long-term measure is still to create a pipeline for, for alternative routes out of the, of the Kazakhs for the oil. Well, thank you. I think that uh, that is certainly prescient for the audience. Um, I'd like to thank our panel, uh, and I hope you can join a, join us in this and and say thanks to all of you for really a uh, really thoughtful presentation. So, just a reminder to the audience. Um, this entire session is going to be available to you on YouTube, so you can relive all the high points and the low points. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Ambassador Retired Richard Hoagland, our, well, our illustrious board member who uh, would like to speak to all of us. I certainly won't keep you long here because I know we've had an intense long morning. Everyone is ready for lunch. What I've seen once again today is that the value of uh, a, a, a program like this, this kind of a, a think tank get together, is really for all of you to talk with each other. It's a way for you to meet with your colleagues uh, to get new ideas. I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff happening back there that will show up in the next several months that's not happening up here. So I saw an awful lot of that already today. And I'm very pleased about that. I want to do one more, actually make two more points here. First, um, to put something together like this, to get such good people who are willing to talk like this is just a hell of a lot of work. And I want to say a special thanks and recognize Josephine Freund. If you'd stand up, Josephine. She put this together with her team. And I think did a wonderful job. The final point I want to make is that I personally, uh, with over 35 years of diplomacy behind my back now, have always been an advocate of real politique rather than ideology. I think you have to live where reality is. I'm enormously pleased that today we got more than a few doses, good doses of real politique. We heard honesty today, and I think that's terribly important. Yes, that there were lots and lots of details that build up the background of this information so that we have more in the foundation of the information, but then in the analysis, the real politic came through. And it's not quite the same as what you see in some of the articles that focus on ideology. So I'm enormously pleased the way things went today. And I look forward to doing this again in the future with all of you. Thank you so much.